with another one of those synods. And the Pope, remember, in a synod you bring, you know, a, a couple of hundred, uh, 300 uh, bishops from the, uh, you know, around the world. Now remember, there are 5,000 of us. So, you know, each country only gets to send, you know, up to four, depending on the population of, uh, of the country. And um, there is, you know, the uh, focus uh, on the role of, you know, the Bible in our life. There are many different levels. I mean, Bibles, you know, people, many, many people read part of the Bible every day. And that's an important part of their spiritual life. Many people are very much committed to being part of, uh, of a faith-sharing group. And oftentimes that it flows from, you know, Bible study, uh, reading a particular book of the Bible, just, you know, just to, you know, to focus it for a moment, there are 72 books in the Bible. When you see a Bible, there are 72 different books. 45 of them are in the Old Testament and 27 are in the New Testament. So, I mean, it, you know, there's a great variety. Some are history books, some are about evangelization, some are, are, are songs, you know, like the book of Psalms. And then, of course, you have the Gospels, which is the good news of Jesus Christ, and so on and so forth. Also, the use of the Bible in that document and in the document on the sacred liturgy, which came out of the Second Vatican Council uh, a little over 50 years ago, um, that the church now is very much teaching that the Bible needs to be, the sacred scriptures need to be an important part of our public worship. When I was a boy, you know, there was a schedule, you know, there were 52 Sundays in the year and there was Christmas and all of that. And, and, and if you went the first Sunday of, of February, the readings would be the same this year and, and last year and next year. And, and, you know, so there was not a big, a big exposure to the Bible. Sacred Scripture, you know, the church was certainly for sacred scripture, but it was not uh, publicly uh, widely used. In the Second Vatican Council, and it was affirmed in this recent uh, synod, that the church strongly urges that the new ways of doing it, for example, now in the course of a year, we have readings on Sunday, and those readings we will not hear again until two years down the road. It's a three-year cycle. So what we had was one cycle that just kept being repeated each year, and now there are three cycles. So there's automatically that much more um, you know, reading and proclaiming the Word of God. On weekdays, instead of it being just one cycle for the 52 weeks around the world, the, you know, the weekdays now, the readings are on a two-year cycle. So what you heard today you will not hear again until 2016. Again, in the effort to uh, enrich our lives, listening to the proclamation of God's word, the same now has happened with the celebration of the sacraments, that each one of the sacraments has um, a number of readings that have been chosen because of they speak about 
the mystery of marriage, for example, or the mystery of a person being baptized, and you know, holy orders or whatever, confirmation. And that leaves it up to the, you know, the local community that we are encouraging there, looking at the readings and suggesting what readings they would like, for example, when I go to a confirmation. When I go to confirmations before I go, we send to the parish what's called a worship guide, a planning document. And the, you know, the pastor, the DRE, they look at it, they go to the book, and they see that they have eight choices for an Old Testament reading. They have 14 choices for a, a, uh, a New Testament reading. And they might have another 18 Gospels. That gives that parish now a chance, first of all, it might be a small group, but it's a representative group, to look at these different readings and see what readings, for whatever reason, resonate with that community. The value of that is then when they send in the, you know, the worship guide, the planning document, it gives us chance then for me to prepare a homily based on the readings. You know, you just don't have a, a, uh, you know, a uh, homily, you know, and it's unrelated to anything. It, it, you know, it, it flows from, you know, the readings. And so you really have to get those two or three weeks ahead of time so that you can plan what you're going to uh, talk about. So the church, in its attempt to make this much more applicable and known and experienced, has really given us a great gift. Now, related to the scriptures in public worship, very much is the homily. Now, again, when I grew up, uh, we never talked about a homily. We talked about the sermon. So the first question is, what's the difference between a sermon and a homily? Well, a sermon is when you, um, you know, prepare for Mass, and you think about maybe what's in the readings, but maybe it's world events, or it might be a, a doctrine of the church, and the priest would you know, prepare his homily, his sermon rather, and the sermon would come out. But there wasn't necessarily a strong connection with the scripture readings that were read. In the Second Vatican Council, they said, you know, really, scripture is what God has shared with us, and the preacher really needs to take account of what God has given. And so now in the documents, they talk about giving a homily. And a homily is reflecting on the readings. Usually, not all the time, but usually the fir uh, on a Sunday, the first reading and the gospel have some relationship to each other. And sometimes the second reading. But more times than not, the second reading is going to be from Paul's letters, and you're going to hear them for maybe five, six, seven weeks. So, so, so even that, you don't get, usually you don't get all three readings on the same you know, point. But you can always get the, almost always you can get the first reading and the gospel together. So what happens is now, this focus on, uh, on the homily, some people wonder, 
you know, it was when we had the, the, uh, you know, the gospel read and then they gave a sermon that the sermon was um, moral or dogmatic. You know, it was teaching that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that was, it was a teaching moment. Whereas a homily is characterized more as delving into the mysteries of our faith, helping people familiarize themselves with the experiential coming to grips with God and our life and me on the journey to God. So there is a slight, you know, a change. However, Oftentimes people will say, well, it's always a homily. Well, the church wasn't absolute on that. It said that you could preach on doctrines and you might be able to preach on liturgical things. So there certainly was a strong uh, you know, desire to increase the mass, the homily, accentuating what was in the readings so that there was a clear connection but it wasn't absolute now some people you know and i mean this is just the mystery of human beings <laughs> you know some people like the idea of looking at the readings and reflecting on them with a message of encouragement uh, of god's presence in our lives and so on other people are looking for a teaching moment. What is the church's teaching on divorce, for example? You know, usually a person who's going to be, uh, you know, preaching a homily might not, you know, uh, do it, you know, a reflection on that, whereas for a sermon, they would because of the different, um, you know, piece of literature that it it turns out. But through it all, the church is emphasizing the place of the Word of God in our lives. Personally, also in groups, and most importantly, when we come together to worship, that that becomes a major part, a significant part a part that people should go home with some message that they have incorporated in their lives from listening to the word of God proclaimed and what the preacher shared with the people from their prayer and reflection. Talking about the public nature of using the word of God, the church, especially when it comes to preaching, we have to prepare. You know, you just don't get up and talk. I remember one time I was, you know, working, you know, in Boston, and I shared the duty with another priest. And the two of us had, you know, had mass each day for a convent of nuns. One of us, you know, uh, you know, on Monday and the other one on Tuesday and so on. But he went for a 29-day trip with his cousin to New Zealand. So, on the 17th day, I finished reading the gospel, and those obedient nuns, they all sat down, and I said, give me a break, I ran out of thoughts. And so they stood up and we did the prayer of intercession. But I just share that, that, you know, that it is important so that you made the effort, you know, 16 straight days, and you got to the 17th and you said, you know, I need a day off from, um, you, know, be, you know, because you just don't get up and wing it. It's the word of God. It's the message of God himself to you know, to us. So it does matter what we do with it. It's not just a filler. 
It really is an opportunity, and that's why preaching is taken so seriously. Now, in October, in October, the priests, every other year, we go to a place just outside the diocese to the west. And, um, and, and there we, uh, Sawmill Creek, you know, we go to. And this year we have two very highly respected uh, Catholic priests whose specialty is preaching. And they're going to come, and for two and a half days, we are going to be exposed to their reflection on preaching, how we should prepare for it, how we should deliver it, and all of those uh, issues around preaching. And I have bought a book for each one of the priests in our diocese on this question, which I will pass out you know, when we get to Sawmill Creek. I mean, it is very important. It's one of the, the avenues of our interaction with the faithful. You know, standing at the door, shaking hands, that's wonderful. You know, uh, you know going around and visiting the CCD classes, that's wonderful. And all of those things are. But there's something special when the priest has prepared, the deacon has prepared, and they are now reflecting on what they have read and thought about the past three, four, five days. And now they get up and they share a message. They share a message of what is significant. What I gained from those hours of reading, reflecting, writing, and then delivering. It's all in the preparation, you know, and hopefully, you know, and, and no two men are the same, you know, and, and some people have a gift, and, and, and some don't have that gift, they have another gift, you know, and, you know, and our ministry is not one dimensional. You know, our ministry is not just preaching. It's also celebrating the sacraments. It's also being pastorally present and supportive for people who are experiencing, you know, difficulties. You know, and, and so, I mean, that's what makes, you know, the, you know, the church, and one of the reasons why we have transfers of priests, so that a priest, as good as he is, at Parish X, there's another priest that when he comes, he brings a different gift. Every one of you have different gifts. And the same is true with priests. Every priest is not the same. But having transfers moves people so that it's not the same experience week after week after week. The church's desire is to enrich people, and it's called the threefold work of Jesus Christ. He was the teacher, he was the sanctifier, and he was the leader. And that's what every priest is called to do. In fact, it's really what every Catholic is supposed to do according to their particular role in their families or in the community. And so the whole idea of, of the role of, uh, of the, you know, the Word of God, certainly in the past uh, 50 years, has been elevated in the most practical way. We hear more of it than we ever did before. Very practical, down to earth, the church said, we're going to give you more of it. And so you're not going to hear that gospel or that reading from the New Testament uh, on Sundays, not for another uh, two years away. Hoping that as we listen and bring it in, it enriches us and not just have a repetition every year. <clears throat> 